Amen. All right, where's my, my notes? What better time to talk about planting seeds and gardening and stuff? Uh, what better time than in the middle of February when it's minus 20 degrees Celsius? <laughs> Probably a good thing to think about. So let's think about some more. Now, I am not uh, by not really a biologist. I, I kind of shied away from it in high school, and I, I went for the, the, uh, the subjects that had less information to memorize. So maybe it was a little lazy of me on that point. But I, I really wasn't that interested. So I took, I took uh, physics and chemistry and, uh, shy, and ma lots of mathematics and shied away from biology. And now, I sort of, do I wish I had taken more? Well, maybe a little bit, uh, except I probably wouldn't have got as high in marks as I got. But anyway, um, <laughs> I'm quite interested now, intrigued, but it's so complicated. Oh my goodness, biology is very complicated. So today, let's think about the reproduction of much of the natural world. A large percentage of plants and animals reproduce via seeds. They do. And it's quite quite interesting. That's the that's what they call sexual reproduction by and large, and uh, yeah, they you know they produce seeds and they you know the seeds like maple keys that flutter around like helicopters and blow all over the place and they start a new plant somewhere or or uh, you know dandelions, everybody's favorite lawn plant, which poofs and it, you know blows off in the wind and spreads seeds everywhere. So there's dandelions. It's hard to keep them away from your property. Um, and then there's the fruit with, with the seed inside it that uh, animals eat and then they carry around and they ploop out the other end and they add fertilizer to it thereby and you know that it springs up someplace else. Fascinating way that the seeds get get uh, moved around. Uh, also spores. Spores are tiny little things that include the information to uh, uh, to produce that life again. I had no idea. I looked it up. Well, what's the difference? See, this is where my my biological education has been lacking. What's the difference between a seed and a spore? Apparently, uh, spores are unicellular, so they don't require a male and a female, and off they go. Uh, and whereas seeds, they do require fertilization. And uh, so, so seeds. I'm, I'm using seeds in the broad term. It's not just. Uh, uh, vegetation, <clears throat> vegetables, fruits, and all those trees and all those things, but but also we people, we mammals especially, that reproduce via seeds being part of it. Sperma is actually one of the Greek uh, words for seed. Another Greek word for seed is spora. <laughs> so, so uh, yeah, th these words that we have for, for, for seed and spore uh, that we use still today in English come from the Greek, which uh, the New Testament was written in. So both those words are in the Greek New Testament. Um, anyway, these little teeny weeny seeds that get stuck in the ground, they contain information for that life. Just incredible amounts of information. So that that little hard seed has got within it, you know, whatever it takes to produce, you know, stalks and, and stems and leaves and flowers and, and all the intricacies of that plant. It's in the DNA. Um, now, not you know, not not all, uh, you know, not all life reproduces that way. There's asexual reproduction, like those suckers that go through the ground and pop up somewhere else, which can be uh, the bane of your existence in a gardener's life. Um, but the, these seeds, they're pretty incredible, really. Uh, and I'm intrigued that this is the way that much of life is formed. It, it starts very very small, um, like the song we just we just sang. Uh, unrevealed until it's seasoned, something God alone can see. So it's hidden. It's 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 very very tiny. It's it's uh, it's usually hidden. Time passes. You know, maybe it's in the ground. Maybe it's in the mom, and it matures, and it becomes fully formed. And then it it comes out. Now, and it, it gets becomes visible and starts to grow and and gets bigger and bigger. But at first, it's very hidden. It's very it's it's rather mysterious. So I I'm an ardent believer in creation um just almost not obsessed with it but i you know it's so to me it's such a plain as a nose on your face truth that is a kind of lost in our day and generation which is sad because uh, i think god gets less credit when we 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 speak less of his creative power uh, and just the incredible complexity and, and designed 
designedness of all natural things, uh, the universe, but also, you know, you know, uh, life, huh. the D DNA I talked about, just incredible amounts of information packed into a little, uh, a little molecule. So I'm an ardent believer, and I also believe that God designed things this way. He designed things to happen via seeds. It's kind of a strange way to do it, maybe, but it works, and it works wonderfully well. It's his way, it's his wisdom to hide life, to hide life, and let it grow until it's able to be public. It's able to be apparent. It's able to be manifested. It's time, until it's time comes. It's hidden. Uh, so that's, to me, that's an intriguing metaphor for the spiritual life. <laughs> uh, and this is the way the spiritual life and the kingdom of God work too. Uh, not surprisingly, because God is the author of both, of both the uh, the natural and the supernatural, or the or the unseen, the, the the mysterious, the uh, the spiritual. And uh, so, the way God works with natural life, hiding it until it's time, He also works with spiritual life. Now Jesus was pretty. Pretty clearly, I would say, taught this as we go through the Gospels. We get that we get that impression. Uh, some of the parables, for instance, the best known one of the best known parables is the parable of the sower. The sower goes forth and they sow seed. And you know, I'm not going to go through the whole story, uh, but there's four kinds of soil that the seed falls on. So, uh, and you know, some of it, uh, you know, it falls on hard path, and the birds come and pick it off. But eventually. Some falls on the good soil, and it reproduces like 30, 50, 100 fold. And, uh, it, but it all, it all takes time. Now, he, it, when he uh, interprets it, this is the only parable, uh, well, maybe not the only one, but it's, it's, it's the longest uh, uh, interpretation of a parable that Jesus gives to his disciples. A lot of the parables are just left as they are, and we're, we we got to sort it out. What, what does that mean? <laughs> and... Uh, um, it's not usually that hard if we have enough, you know, if we use, use the faculties that God gave us and the, the rest of Scripture, we can figure it out. Um, in this case, he gives a very uh, detailed description of what this parable means. And he says right out that the seed is the Word of God. The seed that's sown is the Word of God. So in the spiritual world... Uh, you know, that's, that's what it is. So the, the next parable in the Gospel of Matthew is, is, uh, is a parable of the, the, uh, the, wheat and the, the wheat and the weeds. Uh, so, you know, sower goes forth to sow and he sows, he sows good seed in his, uh, in his ground. But then an enemy comes along and sows bad, sows weeds. <laughs> and then there's a whole, a whole conversation about that. And there's the mustard seed, you know, the tiniest of seeds. You know, you just would hardly ever notice it. And yet it grows into a big, big bush that even the birds of the air can come and nest in. So these, those are three of the parables, and there are some others. Where Jesus talks about agriculture and the seed as a metaphor, a uh, symbol of, uh, of what the spiritual life is like. This is what the kingdom of God is like, is what he says. First, in, in the Peter's epistle, 1 Peter 1, he, uh, he, he tells us, I'm not going to look it up, I think it's chapter, verse 23, he says, you have been born anew. You've been born afresh. You've been born again. Uh, you have, you've received new life through the, uh, the imperishable word of seed. Uh, not, not through perishable seed, but by imperishable seed, the word of God. So he says basically the exact same thing. He's, you know, he's, he's built on it a little bit. Uh, but he tells us straight that our spiritual life comes from the word of God. The Word of God goes in there, and it eventually does something. Like most of us heard, you know, we've heard, we've been privileged. A lot of us have heard the Word of God by our parents taking us to church and taking us to Sunday school and, and hearing the Bible read, and, and you know. And every time that happens, uh, the, uh, the seed it gets sown or it gets watered. And uh, even if it's not conscious for us, eventually it it. It, it kind of secretly is growing in us, and God makes makes miracles happen and brings our spiritual life to birth. So we'll come back to that, that but first let's look at our passage in Luke, Luke 6, which uh, Sue um, Nicholson just read. <laughs> and, uh, uh, it's, it's the chapter, chapter 6, 
has got the what what's called the Sermon on the Plain, and it's the parallel parallel to what in Matthew is the Sermon on the Mount. So there's a lot of the same teachings are included in this sermon. It's much condensed compared to uh, the Sermon on the Mount. Um, so uh, Sermon on the Mount is like three chapters, whereas this is is all in one chapter, chapter six. Um, but what what really happens here is Jesus, I think there's seven blesseds or beatitudes in, in the Gospel of Mark, or Matthew. In Luke, there's only four. So four, and uh, blessed are the poor, blessed are you who hunger, blessed are you who weep, blessed are you when people hate you and exclude you, etc. And there's more to it, though. He, 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 pro, he gives promises with this. Blessed are you who poor, who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, who grieve now, for you will laugh. And blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. In other words, himself. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, because great is your reward in heaven. For that is how the fathers treated the prophets. Then he's got four woes, which are very uncomfortable. And they parallel the blessings. So where he said, blessed are you who are poor, he says, woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. Uh, he said, blessed are you who are hunger now. Now he says, woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Um, blessed are you who weep now, and for you will laugh now. He says, parallel, woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. Uh, Woe to you, blessed are you when people, you know, when you're not popular <laughs> and even persecuted and stuff. And he says, woe to you when all the people speak well of you, for that is how their fathers treated the false prophets. In interesting. I mean, this is another great example of Jesus, the master poet. In, in Hebrew, um, Hebrew literature, which is his culture, uh, poetry did not rhyme words, it rhymed ideas. And so, you know, all the Psalms and, and uh, much of the, the prophets in the Old Testament, they're, they're Hebrew poetry. And this is, this is an example of Hebrew poetry because it parallels. Jesus parallels the blessings with the woes. Probably look at the other blessings and woes. Um, and uh, it, it's very much Hebrew poetry, very stunningly, wonderfully done. Um, so before, just as a background to this, as we think about this a little bit more deeply, um, a couple of things to bear in mind. Jesus speaks with colorful hyperbole. You know, uh, he was renowned for that. That was considered, you know, the best of rhetoric. The, you know, the best speakers were able to do that skillfully, and Jesus was the best speaker ever. So in his day, so for instance, I I've, I've have mentioned this a few times, but I will again. What, at, at a couple of points he says things like, you know, if your if your eye offends you, pluck it out. And if your hand offends you, chop it off. Now, did he really mean for us to pluck out our eyes and chop off our hands? No, he did not. That's a that's a what's that a rhetorical question? <laughs> of course he did not. But he was he he was emphasizing the, the the seriousness of what he was talking about. If your eye makes you sin, pluck it out. If your hand makes you sin, chop it off. So, uh, you know, that's called hyperbole. And that's all through the colorful language that he uses uh, to, you know, to, to keep people's interest alive in the, in the stories that he was telling and in the, the teachings that he was, he was giving us. So that's, that's part of this here. I mean, you know, is everybody rich in for it? You know, <laughs> uh, is everybody who, who is not hungry, you know, are they, are they, are you in big trouble? Yeah, no, but Jesus is talking about uh, attitudes and uh, he's talking about, uh, about, about love, about those who have ignored the poor, those who have ignored the hungry, and so on. So, um, yeah. And, and the second thing to note here is that Jesus looks at things and often, often teaches things from the end back to the present, if you will. From the finale, how things are going to be, how things are going to get wrapped, the way things are, will be wrapped up uh, to present time. Uh, so, and the, the, this is a typical example. He says, well, you're, you are poor now, but blessed are you because you will, yours is the kingdom of God. You know, you, you're going to be citizens of, of heaven and of the kingdom of God when that, when that is established. So, yeah, you may have it tough now, but, you know, which is, is very comforting to the poor. 
um, blessed are you who hunger now. And he, he says, says this to his disciples, looking at his disciples, he says, blessed are you who are poor. Uh, and blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. He may be coming up short right now, but boy, you're going to be so well taken care of. Uh, blessed are you who weep now, who mourn, who grieve, because you will laugh. You will be filled with joy. There will come a time. So we're looking from the end back to the present. And also, the, the, the opposite is true. You know, uh, uh, He says, woe to you who are rich. You've already received your comfort. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, so yeah, woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. So the, the strong words from Jesus, and uh, to, but he, he does make his point. Uh, no, notably, the last blessing is when, when it's got a little, little uh, proviso in it, a little extra something. Blessed are you when people hate you, exclude you, and insult you, and reject your name as evil. So they just treat you like dirt uh, and even harm you, abuse you because of the Son of Man. So this is because of me. So this is a this is a blessing that is that is bestowed uh, when we suffer simply because we belong to Jesus, we speak of Jesus, uh, we follow Jesus. Hmm. Um, so so those are the, the the four parallel blessings and woes, very much in keeping with the Old Testament tradition of uh, blessings and curses, if you will. Uh, now here here's the thing about this: it was again super radical, super out there in Jesus' day. In Jesus' world, what he was saying is the opposite of what everyone thought. Uh, maybe especially the Greco-Romans or the Greeks and the Romans, you know, they would never think. They, they all thought, pretty much the whole world thought that if you were well-to-do and if you were well-fed, the gods were smiling on you. You were blessed. You were good. And if not, then the gods were frowning on you and you probably were getting what you deserved because, you know, you're poor and you're hungry and, and you know, you're sad. Uh, so they had very little compassion, very little charity. They, they were in no one to, uh, you know, they decided they had a baby. They didn't want the baby. They just leave it exposed to be, to die from the weather or from, from wild animals. Uh, early Christians were renowned for saving these babies, these infants that people would abandon, but the world in which they, 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 you know, the gospel was beginning to flourish was a world of cruelty. Uh, slavery was rampant, um, as you probably heard. There are some some uh, estimates that uh, of the Mediterranean world of, of the first century that the, that maybe forty percent of the population at from at, at times were, were slaves. Now, slaves, you know, you people would become slaves and they would get their freedom again and stuff. But uh, it was a different kind of slavery than what we've heard about in you know uh, the, what happened in North America, for instance, or more more recently in history. Uh, but, you know, the whole ancient world was rife with slavery of this kind. So, so Jesus comes along and just says the opposite of what everybody thinks. So that, that was the, that was the, the pagan world. Uh, but, but even the Jewish world thought kind of the same thing. Even though what Jesus is teaching is pretty clear from the prophets and the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures, um, other things there gave people the idea that, you know, if you were rich, then God's blessing you and smiling upon you. So when Jesus comes along and says something like, you know, it's uh, it's easier for a camel to a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God, and the disciples are like, what? <laughs> who then can who then can be saved if the rich people who are obviously super blessed, you know? Uh, and Jesus says, well, with God it's impossible, but uh, or with 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 people it's impossible but with God all things are possible so uh, Jesus is is teaching and and putting forth a, a, a perspective which was totally foreign in his day you know blessed are the poor blessed are the hungry blessed are the grieving and blessed are the persecuted and the and the suffering <laughs> Jesus was sowing and here I'm getting back to where I started he's sowing the seed of a whole different worldview with these words. This is new life information. This is the DNA, if you will, of the life in Christ, of the kingdom of God. And from the time he spoke these words until today, they have slowly changed society. So he sowed these seeds into the, 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 the ground of earth, into, the, into human hearts and lives, into society, and it slowly has changed society. 
and so these words, these words go hand in hand with changed hearts. If our hearts have been changed by Christ and we know that we've needed forgiveness and, and the grace of God uh, and healing in our own lives and souls, then when we hear these words, they resonate. You know, blessed are the poor, yeah. Blessed are the hungry, yeah. Blessed are those who weep, yeah. It resonates with us. They, it suits us. It teaches us and it forms us and it gives us hope. And it softens, you know, our hard, selfish human hearts. So, you know, these words, uh, it's gospel truth that goes in and it, it, it does its miraculous work within us. So from, a, from the start, uh, from Christ coming in the beginning of the church, there was a powerful appeal uh, to, to all, you know, those people who were struggling and suffering in the world um, with this good news that you are loved, you know, that you are included, that you matter. You're not, you're not dirt and garbage because you don't, you're not well off and, you know, you go hungry. So you know, people flocked to the gospel. Um, and then once, so, so that was fine, but for many, for, for many centuries, people really didn't have the gospel, the word of God in their own language. So once uh, Luther, Martin Luther and uh, Wycliffe and Tyndale and company started to translate the Bible, I mean, this, this kind of happened basically in hand in hand kind of with the reformation so in the late 1400s and on and and beyond uh so the luther translated the uh the new testament the, the, then i think the whole bible into into german you know Wycliffe and tyndale and these guys they 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 translated uh the bible into english and then you know it was translated into french and it was translated into spanish and in all these languages of of europe and then people began to hear it in their own language and that resonated with them uh, and it, it started to change their hearts. People started caring for the poor. People started feeding the hungry more and comforting the sorrowful. All these things that Jesus is talking about. And they also began to challenge the huge inequalities of the world. The, you know, uh, the power of this began to bring in the rule of law, uh, democracy, democracy, the establishment of universities and of, of, of education, public education, uh, as the centuries went by, of life-saving medical knowledge, of labor-saving inventions and engineering, of uh, an explosion in music and in the arts, um, you, know, you know, came as a result of much of this, this, this seed that, that began to grow and blossom in society. The list goes on. The gospel of Jesus isn't just about getting us to heaven, although it is about that. <laughs> it's about changed hearts. It's about changed thinking. It's about transforming society. Now, Jesus sowed these seeds of change 2,000 years ago, and they are still bearing fruit today, even un unconsciously in, in the world, but still doing so. And our job is to see that they continue to do so and the truth of the word of God and of the, of the good news of Jesus continues to be sown in human hearts. Let's pray. 